reading from John chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death that he was to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The vicar of Holy Trinity Church, Cambridge, and the founder of the Church Mission Society, Charles Simeon, had carved on the inside of his pulpit, so only the preacher could see it, some words from our reading today. Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, for Simeon, those words served as a constant reminder that no matter how learned or eloquent the preacher was, and Simeon was both, the purpose of all preaching is to point people, not towards the preacher, but towards Jesus. Now today we come to the final one of our five sermons in Lent, focusing on our refreshed God for all vision. And that's not a bad reminder to us today, too. As we live out his vision to follow daily, speak boldly, care deeply and tread gently, the primary purpose of all of our words and all of our actions is not to make ourselves look great as individuals or as churches or as a diocese or as a county, but to lead people towards the Lord and Saviour of the world. Jesus Christ. Now, our reading today describes a dramatic scene after Jesus had gone to Jerusalem, where his disciple Philip was approached by some Greeks who spoke those words carved on Simeon's pulpit. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now, as Greeks and therefore Gentiles, they wouldn't have been allowed into the inner courts of the temple in Jerusalem, but they were keen to get close to this man, Jesus, who they probably heard about. In his response to Philip, and maybe to them too, Jesus explains the meaning of his death. He explains that his hour had come and that he would die, but through his death and resurrection, everyone Jews and Gentiles, male and female, young and old, everyone would be saved. Through his death and resurrection, all people would be drawn to himself and be able to draw closer to a holy God. This is the good news of the gospel. But the thing we often tend to forget when we think about how Jesus' death saved the world is exactly that, that it saved the world the cosmos, the earth, the whole world. And that includes people, of course, but it also involves the whole of creation. And that's what this fourth theme of our refreshed vision is all about, treading gently on this beautiful earth that we not only inhabit, but which we're part of. 
Of course, caring for the environment is a very good thing to do in and of itself. Many people of all faiths and none are passionate about climate repair, about recognizing the need to reduce carbon emissions, to preserve ecological diversity, to protect endang endangered habitats, and to live more sustainable lives. But for Christians, and for some other religions too, that task takes on an added meaning. We care for the world and the environment, not just because our lives and the future of our planet depend on it, which they do, but also because creation care is part of God's plan, and therefore our calling as Christians. So when we read, for example, a very well-known verse like John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, we often tend to think that that means people only. But the word there used for world means people, of course, but also every living thing, all of God's creation, the whole world, plants, birds, seas, mountains, animals, everything. Put it very simply like this, at the very beginning of time, God created all of that, the whole world, and it was good. That's what the story of Genesis shows us. But because of sin and disobedience to God, the whole story begins to go wrong. Sin, death, sickness and all the other things that we see and experience day by day that are wrong with our world came in as a result of Adam and Eve's disobedience to God. And when Jesus died on the cross, he came to put all of that right again, not just for human beings, but for the whole of creation. Dave Bookless is the director of the eco-charity Arosha, and he puts it like this in his book, Planetwise. The world was created good and has been spoilt by sin. But through Jesus, there is the hope of salvation, both for people and for the whole creation. For many years, he says, I didn't understand this. I believed that Jesus came to bring salvation for people. And that was the end of it. The world didn't matter, ultimately, because Jesus would rescue us from it. Now I've come to see that that's only half the story. God is much bigger than I'd realised, and his purposes in Jesus are much more far-reaching than I had ever dreamed. You see, Jesus was at one with creation. He lived peacefully on the earth, and when he wanted to explain the things of faith, he did so using the things of nature. His stories feature fig trees, seeds, weeds, wheat, yeast, fish, and trees. So it's no surprise that when he tries to explain the meaning of his death to those who are listening to him, he uses images from botany. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So Jesus uses this image of a seed falling to earth and being buried under the earth before growth and fruitfulness to talk about his own death and resurrection primarily, but also to show us what our Christian discipleship looks like too. It's when we choose to live unselfishly, when we don't always put ourselves first, when we lay down our preferences for the good of other people and the earth for the sake of Jesus himself, that we're most closely following the example of our Saviour. And so I wonder if that is the attitude with which we best approach this fourth theme of our refreshed vision. In choosing to take even small steps and actions that contribute to environmental preservation and repair, to treading gently on the earth we inhabit, we're doing so not because we're eco-warriors, but because we are followers of Jesus Christ who see creation care as a key part of God's story 
and of our calling to follow him. Jesus said, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. This is discipleship and this is mission. All we can do is show people Jesus, to lift him up in our hearts as he was lifted up on the cross. And he will draw all people and the whole earth to himself. Let's pray. Blessed are you, Lord God, creator of heaven and earth. Your word calls all things into being and the light of dawn awakens us to life. May your wisdom guide us this day that we may cherish and care for your good creation and offer to you the sacrifice of our lips, praising you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Amen. <laughs>